Hi, good evening. Thank you so much for coming. We have a panel discussion today with an illustrious panel. Might I invite my panelists to come on stage? Dr. Manoj V. Nair. Dr. Nair is an Indian Forest Service officer by profession. He's a wildlife biologist by training and a naturalist by inclination. After getting his bachelor's degree in zoology and a master's degree in wildlife science from the Wildlife Institute of India, he joined the IFS in year 2001. Besides serving in Odisha, he has also been on deputation as a member of faculty at the WII and the Lal Bahadur Shastri National Academy of Administration in Missouri. He's currently posted as the Chief Conservator of Forest Wildlife in Odisha, and is also the director of the Nandan Kanan Biological Park. Welcome, Dr. Nair. I'd like to invite Abhiram Shankar to please come up on stage. Abhiram Shankar is from Trivandrum in Kerala. He was initiated into birding in 2007 in the Shola grasslands of Shenderne Wildlife Sanctuary, and he's traveled India extensively in search of birds. He is equally excited to keep track of avian movements in his local patch and yard. He is an active e-birder, enjoys speaking about birds and enjoying traveling to see them. He is an Indian Administrative Service Officer and he currently resides in Masuri in Uttarakhand. I'd like to invite Anita Mani to come up on stage. Anita lives, works, and birds in Delhi, and it's from Delhi that she runs the Indian Pitta, which is a book imprint with Jagannath Books. It's India's first imprint dedicated to birds, conservation, and uh, policy making for birds and conservation. She also writes on technology and communications, and she used to run the operations of a communication software company. Her work journey is something like that of a migratory bird. She has oscillated from writing, first for the Hindu business line and the business standard, and then she moved to a corporate career. Now she's back to writing and mentoring other writers. She also ran for several years a publication called Child Friendly News, which was for children, a news and current affairs publication. Uh, my fourth panelist is Pia Sethi. Pia Sethi is an ecologist who works on conservation and policy issues, and she's interested in the management of forest, plant, animal mutualisms. She has a degree in conservation biology from the University of Maryland, uh, and an MS in ecology from Pondicherry University. For her PhD, she studied the impacts of hornbill hunting in Arunachal Pradesh. She's an alumnus of the Conservation Leadership Program, and she's a senior fellow at CEDAR, which is the Center for Ecology Development and Research. She's greatly interested in community conservation, shifting cultivation, and the role of traditional ecological knowledge in Northeast of India. I am Neha Sinha. I represent SOIB. I head policy and communications at WWF India. Let's start. Thank you all for being here. Are you able to hear me? Okay. So the theme for our panel is how do we do the task of mainstreaming birds in society? And each panelist here is a, from a diverse uh, background, and they're going to answer for us how they can mainstream birds in their fields. I'll start with Abhiram Shankar, and I'd like to ask you, Mr. Shankar, how we can use policy to constructively bring in birds into the mainstream. Uh, yeah, afternoon all, and thank you, Neha. Uh, 
so i'll start with a disclaimer even though i am from this service i represent my personal opinions here so those things matter so i am talking on my behalf okay i'm not representing the government or something so um, bringing birds into policy uh, what i have felt is that uh, we do speak in the public sphere about certain policies or actions of the government or which which tend to take away habitat which are putting species at risk at the same time there is an other angle to it which uh, for whatever reason many of us are not aware outside the uh, policy circles outside the sarkari circles is like for example i can name one one is this namami gange which is going on the river rejuvenation so one critical aspect of it is biodiversity river and biodiversity there is funds there are funds also being pumped into that there are people working on river and ecosystems so when there are act and there is a national mission on sustainable habitat there is a smart cities mission so many aspects have environmental sustainability built into it because it is part of our national commitments to uh various protocols whether it is the ic biodiversity protocol or the glasgow or recently uh with respect to deforestation pledges so with everything there is something that we have pledged internationally so when there is something in the open which the government has pledged and which can be used as a leverage i think the communication channels have to be opened up people who are interested need to speak in a language that the government also can understand should understand that these are not birders sitting there in state capitals or the central who run the country or the state so these are people who are administering for other reasons so people come first that is how administration is conceived of as so when if, when you think of the other things but it is impossible for people to progress or having societies progress without biodiversity without having a good environment to live in and a thriving uh, community of other creatures so the balance is there known to us i'll not talk about that so how do we communicate how do we package the information that we have in an in a manner which resonates with the other side so that also needs to be thought of if it is complex if it is scientific if it is uh, in in a manner which cannot be digested by the other side so that is one and the second is understanding priority so when some when there is a policy or a framework which talks about doing something for example wasteland which the, the government terms it wasteland these days thankfully it has come down to grassland conservation decades back it was simply called wasteland management so anything which was open and dry was a wasteland so plant so i have worked in the deccan in north karnataka where beautiful scrub hills and all ashwin knows like i have crept to him many a time so glycidia like all this weird uh, plants have been planted all over the place that would have been excellent grassland habitat and even now there are pockets where there are hyenas and uh, all those things are even uh, mammals so how do we deal with that is it possible so when we talk of planting is it possible to bring in natural flora flora that is endemic to that region or native to that region like you can't because there is tea growing in manipur doesn't mean you can go and plant it in meghalaya maybe it doesn't occur in meghalaya so these are small differences we are not looking at a political boundary it's a biogeographical boundary that we are thinking of how do you communicate this how do you sell this and understanding the priorities of the other side so that we know what the non negotiables are on both sides because many a times because i have been on the administrator's chair i have seen this uh, becoming a crisis tipping point i'm not sure if i have people from mysore here but some might be online but whenever there is conservation related discussion happening in the open it tends to sway to this side or that side once the the extremes are taken then it becomes very difficult both the parties will start it's like a negotiation right it's you are negotiating for particular position so what is your non negotiable what is the uh, the the point where you get your maximum value for the idea that you are seeking that needs to be thought of i think that is where Uh, we need to improve upon there are people who do it well but it's not easy i'm not saying that if it was easy then we would not have be having this question post or talking about it it is difficult but uh, needs broaching and praveen is aware like hoskote i have been chipping in but uh, praveen and subbu and all have been working quite a lot on preserving one lake outside bangalore those who are familiar with bangalore but it is difficult there are other reasons at play how do you create the community support how do you create the goodwill of the elected representatives the people who are the stakeholders locally so these are things which need to be looked at so we often hear uh, mr shankar that there's so many birds why do we need to save another bird right we have 1300 plus bird species what would be your answer to that i mean because you've been on both sides uh, you've been in the government and you're also a birder so if if somebody says why do we need to save one more bird like there are too many of them what would you say uh i have not heard of anyone say that 
first of all, frankly, like as in, I've really not heard. Like, of course, with tigers and bears and all, people do say when there are big mammals involved. Birds, people don't see. It's not that they don't like. Suppose we say that Jordan's coaster. I have not seen a Jordan's coaster. There must be very few um, uh, who might have seen. But if you say that, we need, they do not know what is it. It's like, or you talk about an, some kind of owl, like nocturnal species, they were saying that it's, it's, even the trends are difficult to gauge. For people who are birding so intensely, we do not know. So how do you, come? It's, it's a matter of communication also, to bringing it to their notice that these things exist around you. And if possible, to bring in an economic argument, Salim Ali did that. He spoke of the economic benefits of birds. He looked at it in a very rational way, in an impassionate way. So is it possible to bring that in? Recently, there was an article on uh, in The Economist, I think this week or last week, which talked about how illness in India grew as vulture population declined. So, uh, when, so these are all these are all studies from here and there which can be helped to support seed dispersion. So there will be plants which are sacred. There are trees which are sacred, which are useful, which depend on certain uh, frugivorous animals or birds. So is it possible to bring that? You, the moment you say frugivorous, they'll be like, okay, some scientist has come. No, it's going to be too much. So how do you distill it in a way that a common man understands? How do you touch the emotional chord or maybe the, the basic senses of that person? So I'm guessing that we need a combination of logic and the Soft heart, skills. head and the heart. So my next question is for Anita. Uh, Anita, what way should we use to take birds to the youth? Because as Abhiram said, uh, we, we don't know which birds we have. The common person does not know. She doesn't know how many kinds of birds we have. What would, because you're a publisher and you're also a communicator and a writer, what would you suggest is the way or kinds of ways that we can take birds to the youth? Okay. Well, I think one thing we know for sure is that there's a huge amount of interest in birds among young people. Uh, a few years ago, Delhi Bird Club started a small club, a junior version of itself for young people. And uh, the walk saw a huge response from young people from all over the Delhi NCR. And I think in Bangalore, the early bird program has had fabulous feedback from uh, scores of young people who sign up for its various online programs. I think that's, uh, so that will tell you that, and there are books about birds which are now coming out for children. DK had a series of uh, field guides for young children a few years ago. And I think uh, Zai has written a lovely book on her, on her memories of Salim Ali, on Salim Mamu and me. And all these books are doing very well. So which should tell you that, uh, that there is a huge interest, which is really good news. And I think uh, much as we, like I think I was until recently the parent of a teenager, we think that they can't be wrested away from uh, mobile phones and devices. And I think they can. I think birding is a way to, great way to get young people out outdoors. And it is addictive. as. As all of us who fell into this deep, dark hole called birding, we, it is extremely addictive. So, yes, so I think there's great amount of interest for one. And so how do you tap that interest, which is what you're asking? For me, the first answer is, and will always be books. And I think, um, uh, and I want to step back and look at not just youth, but the general public. And uh, you look at what Silent Spring did when it came out, and it wasn't quasi-academic publication, but it changed. It, 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 Chris, it catalyzed the EPA Act, it brought in so many changes, but public opinion and public opinion seemed to matter so much. And it is all catalyzed by a book. I think given the issues that we have in India today, India is ready for its silent spring moment. And I'm really hoping somebody will write that book. I think Aarti Kumar Rao's book is a great step in that direction. And I think, uh, I think we need more books of that kind. And, and at Selfishly at Indian Pitta, I hope I will publish some of those books. And I'm happy, looking forward to publish some of those books. So I think books are a great way to get the message across. But for young people specifically, the visual medium is really, really important. And you look at the kind of work that Sustain is doing in terms of the highly way they've gone visual with a lot of their storytelling. That's the way to reach young people. And um, in another way, not another way to answer your question is how do we do it? And I think there I want to talk about uh, specifically the fact that, you know, take the analogy from television. A lot of us have Netflix, Prime, we have Star, what are all the other channels, but viewer interest is always uh, program driven and not channel driven. It's about a program that gets your interest in the same way in, in many of these cases, young people might not be able to read through the SYB report in great detail, but they would be very interested in species. So you have to drill the message at the species level. 
And I think, uh, for example, in Delhi, and I think uh, the report talks about uh, birds of, of, of priority for conservation at the state level, which I think is really, really important because that changes so much with every state. And in Delhi, if I, if I, may, if I may say so, I mean, one of the birds is the skimmer. Yes. And, uh, and I think a campaign like Save Our Skimmers, very specific to Delhi, would catalyze a lot of interest in young people. And I'll end by just saying that among urban youth, and I will not speak for anyone other than urban youth, since they have been the people I've been primarily interacting with, there's a lot of hunger to make a change, to make a difference. And I think it's about tapping that hunger and catalyzing that emotion. And the tools are, I think, all in front of us. And the data is in the report. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. One of the first departments that people think of when they think of wildlife, conservation, birds, mammals, is the forest department. And the forest department is called if there's a leopard, whether it's a negative thing or a positive thing, it's the forest department that's called. So my next question is for Dr. Nair. Um, sir, how do we operationalize some of the findings of this report with the forest department? Because one of the recommendations of the report is to have more systematic monitoring done by the forest department. As an avid birder and a naturalist and an administrator yourself, sir, what would be some of your suggestions? Uh, thanks, Neha. First of all, before we actually get into the meat of my answer, I should uh, I was just blown away by the presentation that was done. So I, we had a sort of a peek sneak at the report that was sent to us earlier. That itself was very impressive, but when I saw uh, the background work and the app and the website, I absolutely I was just blown away in the sense that I, I mean, it is such a phenomenal amount of work Thank that you. is already there. Thank and so big much. hand to all the people involved. Uh, I don't think even in many other countries actually, we might have something similar. Maybe, I mean, I, I, I mean, I've, I was there. Anyway, so I'll, I'll come back to that question. So it's amazing. Uh, it's hats off to you. It's up to us now to us in the sense, all of us to now think about how we actually make use of it. So now I come to the uh, my answer per se. Uh, so I've always wondered about it actually because I, in fact, during one of the initial meetings that we had, I think that it's not the lack of information per se that is the issue. We do know uh, quite a lot of what needs to be done. Uh, it's it's how how to you know actually get onto the brass tacks, how to institutionalize it is the problem. So I think I'll just quickly go through some of the thoughts which uh, you know I was thinking about as to what as a uh, you know as a, uh, a natural resource manager or, or as a forest officer I should take back from this report while I was going through it initially. Uh, I think uh, first and foremost. Uh, See, all of us understand that the forest department or the MOEFCC and the state departments put together literally control huge, huge swathes of our country. I mean, the, I mean, we literally handle all, I do not know the exact percentages, I was trying to look it up, but unfortunately I couldn't find a figure, but it's, it, it is massive. Entire natural capital is vested with this particular department, so to say, actually, the primary stakeholder. So for this report, I think if you can point out one primary stakeholder, it has to be the department actually. And the earlier we, re we realize it, the better. So I think a uh, uh, few things. I'll start from the policy perspective. It's a very good thing. You've given an actually a nice policy brief. Uh, so you have it ready on a platter for somebody who's interested, let's say in MOEF. Uh, I think it can be made into a small, more readable flyer with with clear-cut recommendations, actually. I mean, we can work on it a little later, of which I think a couple of points also can be potentially included. Uh, one thing which I feel, I mean, this is for the policy framework for the center, center I'm talking about. One thing which the report uh, possibly is quite silent about is exit to conservation and conservation breeding programs per se. Uh, I think this time has come for us to really take a good look at it, actually. So I think uh, uh, the Central Zoo, Central Zoo Authority is a nodal agency that we're under the MOEFCC, which has a mandate to look at exit to conservation and conservation breeding programs for birds. Of which, uh, uh, you know, if I remember correctly, there are about 94 species or something, uh, Narsimha, uh, which, is, which is, you know, listed as number of uh, species which require conservation breeding. I mean, all the, all, all the taxons put together, mammals to uh, birds, uh, reptiles, etc. And birds are just about 
hardly about 21, if I remember correctly, of which 13 are pheasants. Uh, and this does not include the Great Indian Busted Project at all, actually, because that's a completely different special project. So I think it's, it's time that we actually took a close look at what are hands-on conservation breeding as well as you know, species recovery projects that can be put in place. And that also includes things like you know, developing rescue centers, capacity of forest staff to you know, handle, respond to situations, etc. Uh, this is just one policy uh, uh, intervention which I'll frame at the central level. But all the action takes place in the states. So now I'll come on to what the state departments can potentially do. I think the first and foremost is, I, I know we've kept talking about, uh, you know, uh, the species for which we don't have data. In fact, I have a cheat sheet with me. I don't think I'll go into the details. But, uh, you know, roughly about 60% of, uh, 60 or 50% 50, 50 of all the birds that you've listed, about 924, does not have enough data for a proper analysis, if I'm not wrong, actually. Get proper trends. I mean, long-term trends as well as short-term trends. I think uh, the forest department can do an awful lot in this particular issue. And how do you do it? I think just a simple intervention. Uh, some of the states have actually started doing it. eBird is a, is a great tool that we have you know, for us to use. But I have not really seen, when I'm traveling, I mean, even, even I'm, when I'm traveling all across the country, I hardly see frontline staff even away, being aware of it, actually. Most of them, all of them have smartphones. So I think capacity building of frontline staff and enabling them to actually, you know, get hooked to birding. I think without, uh, I mean, it can't be a set of instructions that is passed on, nor an executive order. It has to be passion driven or interest driven. You have to spark their interest. I think the best thing to do is to actually catch them young in the sense that I'm just now, I mean, that, that's an adage which all of us should uh, adopt. But I think I'm specifically talking about forest staff. Forest staff in the sense, yes, let's start from IGNFA, which where IFS probationers are trained, uh, Central Forest Academy, the range officers in the ACFs are trained, and even the, you know, forest guards are trained in forest training schools. We have a lot of, you know, outdoor activities, a lot of, I mean, I, it has to be incorporated in the syllabus. I mean, easy to say, but we need to really work on it. And you'll be surprised, I actually bothered to look into all these syllabus, actually. We really do not have anywhere. Yeah. A bird, I'm, I'm, it's maybe not possible to look at a, taxa, a taxon alone, but why not? Because they are so conspicuous, so interesting. They are uh, wonderful surrogate species, excellent indicators of, uh, you know, proximate as well as distal changes in our habitats. So I think that's something which we should work on. And number three, uh, coming down to the brass tags, very obvious, I mean, I'm talking about very obvious things, but something which we need to put in place. See, for instance, uh, on the ground enforcement, simple things like uh, protecting areas outside protected areas actually. Uh, Suhail rightly pointed out, it's roughly about 5% of the, uh, the, the total land area is actually land and uh, of course near coastal areas are protected technically, but all the rest is open and it's all commons actually for all that you, but nevertheless it still comes under the ambit of one or the other forest division. So it's high time that you know each division uh, had a look at uh, what resources they hold in terms of birds and specific action plans to be developed actually. So I think, uh, um, I mean, um, these are very small, apparently on the face of it, small interventions, but which can have a very strong uh, role to play. The department, I'm sure, will have major roles to play in terms of outreach and education also. Just because of so much of resources we have, we control access to so many areas. So if you look at, I don't know, I'm. Um, uh, but I mean, it'll be an interesting analysis to do, to look at, you know, what is the percentage uh, critically endangered or threatened birds, forest birds particularly, which are getting reflected in eBird. I think there might not be too many, actually. I was just looking at for information, just for pale cap pigeon, for instance, actually, and it does not have, it is uh, indeterminate because you don't have enough data for it, actually. Why? Because it's all confined to protected areas and, and oftentimes core of the protected areas. So it's a question of frontline forest staff getting involved, and not only just for you know populating this data set, but also for the sense of belonging that they should have. Uh, I think that these are things that we should actually try to do. So we've had over 30,000 bird watchers contributing for this report. So you know, if your vision comes to reality, we might have 30,000 forest uh, staff. I really wish I could see the <laughs> such a day. Yeah, I mean that would that would be amazing. Also, because birds are probably the first wildlife anyone sees 
They really are everywhere. Thank you so much for that. Uh, one of the strong recommendations of the second State of India's Births Report is to have more research, is to have more systematic research, to have research which is birth specific and also understanding why births are declining. So we've outlined that births are declining, but we don't know the reasons why. So my next question is for Pia Sethi, who is a researcher and an ecologist. Uh, what in your vision would be the main main takeaways for the research community based on the SOIB2. Right. So I think uh, researchers are ones who are going to read the report from cover to cover. And uh, probably amongst all the audiences, uh, we'll be looking at it just in terms of all the information which is available. And this is actually a very, very deep dive, not only in terms of which birds are prioritized, high priority uh, in terms of conservation or low priority, but what's amazing is this particular report outlines a number of threats and it identifies research gaps and areas where more research is required. So for example, I don't know how many of you were here for the earlier presentation, but insectivores, for example, are declining and we don't know why. Raptors are declining. So what are the causes? It's poorly understood in India. It, could it be because of pesticides? Is it because of the quantum of insects they're eating? So actually, I found that this particular uh, report was full of information for researchers, which researchers can actually use as a process to guide them. And I know a lot of us would like to work on charismatic species, but what's interesting is here they've outlined some of the common species, why they're becoming more common. And that's really interesting in terms of understanding what are the factors which are actually promoting is a disturbance which is promoting some of the most generalist species. So there's actually a wealth of information to be taken away from here. And what's uh, particularly amazing about eBird is just the canvas of coverage. Now, as a researcher, it's almost impossible to get these large data sets, you know, spatial temporal data. It, it's such a boon. And as you said, you know, this is based on 30,000, uh, I mean, uh, 30 million records, 30,000 researchers who've actually contributed. So there's a lot which can be done in terms of citizen science and in terms of research. And uh, one of the takeaways from this is how important it's actually to do long-term ecological monitoring, as well as smaller scale studies to understand what are the impacts for particular bird species, what is happening to the ecosystem which is actually threatening them, uh, what are the factors, is it climate change, is it an amalgamation of factors, is it deforestation, is it monocultures, is it toxins in the environment. So there's actually a wealth of information of what can be uh, carried out and it's important for us as researchers to actually be able to do it. But we also need a very facilitative, enabling policy environment and a legal environment which actually gives us the scope. So I know as a researcher, it's often very difficult for us to get permits in time. We write our proposal, we get funding from the funding organization, and then there's such long delays in the entire process that it becomes really difficult. So you're always looking for you know, facilitation from the government and others to help you start on your work. So those are some of the issues which we need to be looking at. And also it's really important that conservation is driven by good science. I mean, it shouldn't be up in the air. We need to make sure that whatever recommendations we give are based on, on good science. And even in terms of the working plans that we have or the management plans that we have, we need to ensure that birds also play an important role. They are not, I mean, they're not considered to be, uh, you know, large carnivores and very, very charismatic, perhaps to some, for us, they're really important. So, so we need to ensure that uh, all these reflect how important uh, science is. And we need to have uh, uh, an atmosphere which encourages uh, and, uh, science, because we can't talk about conservation, we can't talk about protection of our ecosystems unless we're able to do that kind of research which is required. So that's really, really critical. I think one of my takeaways from all your answers is that it's up to us to make birds popular. It's up to us to um, 
have everyone catch the birding bug, so to speak. And because birds are everywhere, it, it may not be as difficult as we think it is. I'd like to open up the floor for audience questions. Uh, I'll be asking a few questions after that as well. But if there are any audience questions at this point for the panel. There's a question at the back. Thank you. I think uh, the report. Sure. Um, so congratulations on the report. Uh, this might be a very naive question. By the way, I'm Binay Panda from Jawaharlal Nehru University. I heard that it's not true that all the bird species number are going down. Some numbers are also going up. So we may think that it's not the common mina, the crow, the black kites in the city. But there are birds which are very unusual, which you wouldn't think, but their numbers are going up. So I was just wondering, during the process of making the report, what are those unusual birds that you found where the numbers are going up? In fact, the reason I asked this, it was very um, surprising to me. Um, when I heard the, I was in Denmark for a few months, and I heard the legendary Danish bird of John, I couldn't pronounce his last name, some Norwegian Danish bird of the, the legendary, I think, Felsa or something. Maybe that's not the right pronunciation that they found in the last 100 years that many unusual birds in Scandinavia, the numbers are going up. So in India, during the study, what are those unusual birds numbers that you found their numbers are going up? Because this is a very interesting research question. Because the, the, you know, the, the thought process is that the, we need to conserve more, the bird numbers are going down. Of course, they're going down many birds. But is it true that all birds are going down? So the questions for are for the panel, and the panel was not involved in the making of the report. So let me answer on behalf of SOIB. So there are many birds that are doing well, that are thriving. One of them is the obvious one, which is the blue rock pigeon that you see everywhere in, the, in Delhi and in other cities. Another is the ashy prenia, which is a garden bird. And we don't know why it's doing so well, but uh, it, the numbers have really gone up. The third is the national bird, the, the peak. The peak. Uh, some birds are doing moderately well. Um, the glossy ibis, which is a water bird, is doing well. It's gone up. And at the same time, equally, uh, some common birds are not doing well, which we would assume uh, were all right, are not doing well, such as the uh, great gray shrike, such as the forest wagtail. Um, the Indian roller, which is called the, I think it's called the Nilkant in some parts of India. And uh, it's a bird that's iconic uh, to the Indian countryside, uh, but it's not doing well. So it's a mixed bag, really. What we really need to do, abundant Indian peafowl impact other birds. So if some, something is doing very well, like the rock pigeon, for example, is it displacing other birds? Is it uh, harming other birds? That is something that's a further research question. Thank you. Are there any other questions for the panelists? Yes. The theme of the panel is how do we mainstream birds in society? Could you give her the mic, please? Oh. Good evening, everyone present. My name is Naivavani, uh, and I'm from Delhi Technological University. I'm a research scholar. Um, I have a general question. So if we talk about mainstreaming biodiversity or mainstreaming birds, so I want to take it up at the level of urban climate and urban biodiversity. So climate, I put emphasis on because we can take cities or urban areas as uh, city islands so in geography, so we have more generalist species found in urban areas. So I put, uh, I link it with biogeography because of the varying climate in urban areas compared to the surrounding areas. And the biodiversity aspect also, birds or say urban birds, urban biodiversity would have a success in the future if we include more of urban vegetation biodiversity or more of native biodiversity, vegetation uh, biodiversity in uh, policy making for urban planning. 
So what will be the future of uh, birds and even small mammals for that matter? Would you like to take that, Mr. Shankar? And Mr. Dr. Nair as well, both of you. Uh, so the way I understand the question is that, uh, like how will, what, what is the impact that we, it will be there on biodiversity if we focus on certain species of flora, is that? Yes, sir. Okay. A certain okay. species of flora in respect of their heat mitigation properties or for controlling okay. urban heat. Okay. I am not a researcher. I, I cannot go into the aspect which I am not aware of. But uh, definitely, if you have this, the variety of uh, the, the, the variety of trees that are planted, if you look at that, the difference. I can speak of Bangalore because I have birded in Lalbagh, in Kabban Park, in GKVK, which is like in different parts of in and around the city. So. De definitely where there is a variety of uh, diversi diversity of habitats and where native trees are in abundance. So the, the diversity does show, uh, the, the impact does show on the, the diversity of birds that you see. So I think uh, uh, that is there and the more ornamental and fancy kind of things are there, it lesser it is. And people f feel that I have seen from conversations, people generally point out saying, oh, you are a bird watcher, see there are parakeets here. So you see all the soft wood trees, gulmohars maybe, lot of parakeets and miners, roosting sites and also uh, rain trees, for example, like large numbers, but uh, diversity of species is less. That is my experience. I can't support it with data because I, have, I do it out of joy, so I don't have data other than what I have logged on eBird. So, but this is what observation wise I can say. Maybe you can. I didn't, I didn't catch your name. Daivavani Krishna. Okay. Daivavani, so uh, see, uh, obviously a complex problem and you asked a complex question actually. Uh, to the extent I understood it, let me put it this way. Uh, you talked about island biogeography. We did to a more elite class or an upper middle class of people may not have you know, free and equal access to this. So um, how would you comment on the role or representation or um, contributions of people say, in more rural parts of um, India? And I don't know, I'm, I, maybe this is for people who worked on the book also, where you know what regions the contributions came from. I was just interested to know that. But yeah, that way, how can we? Include or what would what is the current role or the future or just your comments on that? Yes, please. So you know, one is the this is the common perception that bird watching is elitist because equipment is expensive and you know uh, the gear is expensive and it's largely urban. I won't comment I mean, on the people data from watch the birds, but bird watching like I don't know where the distinction is. Well, yeah. that's that's the question. Do we have to make that distinction? Yeah. Because you know the uh, uh, you can watch birds with no equipment. Yeah. I mean, I think we all began that way, and uh, and uh, you can. I'm not sure about the data and whether how much data came from rural urban. I'm not in a position to answer that, but I do know that uh, the interest in birds I think goes beyond equipment and the so-called birders. As, you, as, as we define them. And I, and I say this very simply because you know, we, I've been working with children and uh, children who write in about birds and we ran a whole bunch of columns and contests. And I remember though we had hundreds of entries from all over India, uh, from remote parts of India, uh, where certainly there were any equipment and stuff, but they were simply writing about the birds and animals that they saw and they were engaging with. So I think, um, Sure, they're not able to contribute to the scientific inquiry like eBird, they're not on those platforms, but I think everything has to be seen as a nuance of a step. You it's not a binary to go from A to B, there are gradations, and I think this is part of the process. Yeah, I'd like to. Uh, so, in some ways, I agree with you. I mean, uh, whether it's access to technology, although eBird and all are now on go. And actually, we had started a project in Nagaland where we were working on community conservation and trying to promote awareness about birds with local communities. And what we found was very, very effective was when people volunteer, they could be researchers, they could be any experienced birders, all the people in this room, they, they would actually visit these 
areas, hold training programs, have capacity building, and it could be in numerous ways. So, for example, if people were taking up uh, e uh, bird ecotourism, training in terms of things like marketing, for example, or actually keeping accounts. So, so I think that's a role each of us can really play because uh, we found it to be very effective. People would pay their way there, and then they would look at the birds, they would document the birds, and they would hold training programs. So I think that's one of the ways in which we can ensure that it becomes a lot more inclusive. But like Anita said, I don't think there are barriers to birding. And that, that's one thing about birds. It's very accessible to everybody. But yes, I do think we need to put in more training and capacity building efforts into the process. My next question is, OK, Chetan. Can somebody give him the mic? Hi, I'm Chetan Agarwal. It's very directed to the to Manojji here. Uh, what would be that? Could there be some takeaways from this kind of analysis for the management practices uh, which the department uses, uh, either wildlife or, or or territorial areas, both in terms of uh, while logging is done, yeah. uh, you know, areas which if certain species require certain types of trees or dead or fallen and all that kind of uh, as and also when planting is done which is a huge exercise uh, done across the country every year so can we plant in a way that it's more bird friendly yeah thanks for that question actually Chetan. so i'll approach it in two ways uh, certainly uh, one uh, i'll come to the second part of the question first planting part i think what is happening right now is that we have a fetish for planting right now we planting everywhere. I think uh, the National Green Mission, the amount of funds that is being, you know, just pumped down into uh, planting per se, uh, is not a really good uh, sign actually, as far as I am concerned. So this report particularly focuses on what I call ONEs, ONEs, or open natural ecosystems actually. So as Suhail rightly talked about, you know, we have so-called blanks in the middle of forest. So in a classical silvicultural mindset, those are areas to be planted up. Because those are, you know, subproductive uh, or even unproductive habitats which need to be, you know, brought to what is called a normal forest, actually, in a silvicultural parlance. I think that uh, is a very partly colonial, uh, uh, I would say, uh, antiquated mindset, which is also kind of changed. So the first thing would be what to plant and whether to plant or not. Even I would so f I, I would go so far as to say that uh, you know there is this, this particular recently there's been a lot of, lot of focus on planting up uh, planting mangroves as you know a climate uh, disaster mitigation schemes. I mean huge projects are getting launched externally funded and so on and so forth. So much so that in Odisha, uh, because you know I'm actually involved in finding out places for planting, we are not able to find out places to plant mangroves actually just because there's already secondary natural regeneration happening. And they need to be tiny inundations. You can't build fishbone channels everywhere and build. And in the process, what is happening? You know, uh, what are called mud banks, which are tidally inundated, which are existing natural ecosystems, which are home to a whole range of species, actually, including, you know, very, very exotic, very important species, detritus feeders like mudskippers, for instance. So if you go and plant mangroves there, I mean, you're going to take away the habitat for a whole range of stuff, which can have cascading effects. So I think plantation is something which we need to look at it very closely, number one. We need to have open areas also. I mean, I'm not talking about an ecological perspective. Edge effect is very important. We need to have, you know, what's called a, uh, something like a, a, a disturbance. If you look at a disturbance regime, it has to be in a medium uh, disturbance format and so on and so forth, actually. So I think uh, that is one. Number two, coming to your first part of the question, the 2014 uh, working plan code has bro already brought into picture a lot of wildlife friendly, uh, extension of logic bird friendly, uh, you know, measures, which is already laid down. For instance, you know, there are several, uh, you know, standing trees for that, standing snags for that matter. They are not to be felled. Earlier it used to be considered as uh, things that, has, that had to be taken out, weeded out, because it harbors, you know, uh, silviculturally important pest species of beetles and so on. So now that's not, not uh, done. In both, the, both sides of a stream, there has to be a, a strip of 20 meters that has to be left. There are, you know, you have to do a sample plot and evaluate the density, not only stand density, also the vegetation diversity of the area. And if it's so beyond, a bit higher than a certain point, 
that has to be included under what is called a protection working circle or a conservation working circle and not in any felling series and so on. So 2014 code has brought into, brought into the light a whole range of uh, prescriptions already, which I think is kind of taken care of. And slowly we are moving away from a silvicultural product, production forestry framework. Now what we need to be very cautious about is a whole range of other uh, mega projects coming in, like for instance, uh, uh, from other sectors, like you know, the urge to be self-sufficient as far as edible oils are concerned. So, so your uh, palm oil cultivations coming in a big way in the northeast actually, which are replacing uh, uh, primary evergreen forest or even you know secondary fallow, jhum fallows of various ages. Uh, these are some things which need to be very, uh, very careful. Uh, I think these are uh, so. These are two concerns which you know. I think the department has to be has looked at it very closely in the coming years. Thank you. I'm going to move on to my question now for the panel, and let's try to end on a happy note. What is your favorite bird memory? We'll start with you. Tell us a bit about your favorite bird memory. It could be, you know, a story of loss, or it could be a story of hope. Um, and give us the gory details: the okay. place, the bird. Uh, how you there felt. is a pre-birding. I started birding in 2007, so there is a pre-birding memory, and there is one when I started immediately when I started. So pre-birding is. I used to hear three sounds, like I'm from a small town in Trivandrum district, so three sounds, one now I, now I know, one was Shikra, the other was Pale Bill Flower Picker, and the uh, third was uh, so an, uh, White Cheek Bird Bit. So I would hear these three birds, I, would, I did not have a binocular, I had nothing, so somebody was asking about equipment. So that was a time when I was generally intri intrigued about anything that moves or crawls or climbs or whatever. And I was in primary school. So I, I used to fig wonder what bird is this? What is the sound? Because it used to be so close, but so invisible. Like I could never make out where the shikra was. And the joy that when I found out that when I saw the shikra the first time, it had a calotus uh, in its uh, talons. The first time when the flower picker came to the window because it saw its reflection to peck and went back. And the white cheek yeah, barbet, when it came to the papaya, it was an overripe papaya there, it came to eat. So those three were like extremely joyful because I finally saw what I was searching for. I did not know the name. I saw that, okay, this is this bird, this bird. I thought it was some falcon, whatever. Like I, I did not know the name. And when I started birding the very first day, 2007, first week of April, with uh, Wobblers and Weders and organization, so they said, okay, volunteer for the bird survey. I went there in a wildlife sanctuary in the neighboring district, Western Guard. So the first bird, like we were on our way to a shola part called Pandimuta. Uh, so we were on and I suddenly see this uh, orangish brown bird, then a flash, it opens with a lot of black spots and stripes and people are like thumping me and like saying you need to give us a treat. I saw a Malayan night heron. I did not know that, uh, that was the first bird I see when I go for a, so I had no idea about forest birds and all those things. So I see this and I, I thought it's another bird. <laughs> We always look back at the places we went to when we were not bird watchers and we feel so bad that we missed all those birds until the time we became bird watchers. Thank you. <laughs> yes, Dr. Nair, tell us your f favorite bird memory. Well, <laughs> you really put me in a quandary actually, Neha. Because <laughs> so I've been birding since I was a small kid actually. Five and I've, birds. Like I was telling Suhail that I must be having notes from 86 onwards actually in small notebooks. Anyway, and you know, I, we, I've been lucky to uh, do as a profession something which I love doing, um, which has given me a lot of opportunities to travel across, all across and uh, whatever. Uh, so it's uh, so many memories actually, it comes gushing, but I think if you were to ask me to uh, cherry pick one, then that has to be a very exotic memory uh, dating back to 2018. So when I, when I had this, uh, really I was very lucky to be uh, part of the 37th uh, Indian Scientific Expedition on Antarctica. So we were, we were sailing from Cape Town and one of the mandates, because I, I was there as a scientist, and one of the mandates that I had was to look at uh, uh, distribution of pelagic birds across latitudes actually, from uh, Cape Town all the way up to coastal Antarctica. So, you know, uh, once you set sail after three or four days, you are in the middle of, you know, the extremely vast uh, southern ocean and you are, um, you are in a huge vessel uh, which gets just absolutely tossed around like a small, you know, matchbox. So it's a very atmospheric and a very elemental uh, uh, landscape, actually. So, you know, I was standing in the poop deck of our vessel, uh, trying to look at, you know, I have this data sheet, trying to fill up the data sheet. And then suddenly one day, 
uh, wandering albatross made its appearance actually. I used to see, of course, there are several species of albatross that one used to see, but a wandering albatross just came, this iconic species just came, and it followed us for two days. I mean, it was following the ship, because in the middle of nowhere, there was absolutely nothing, and there would be just, just this ship and this bird, and I would be just standing at the poop deck with my binoculars and my camera and so on, and at times what it would do, it would just fly past. You know, just fly past at very low height, and you know, fly past you, and with absolute, absolutely still wings. Yeah. As you know, it's got the largest wingspan of any living bird, and it's huge. Mm. And as it passes you, it'll just turn its head, and actually make eye contact, it looks directly at you. Mm. And that is, you know, it's just, it's, it's an amazing feeling. As I speak, I get goosebumps, because it's such a, I mean, uh, uh, it's, such a, it's such a wonderful feeling to have that established, that direct connect with another, uh, you know, species, and you are like one to one, the human and the bird. Uh, and uh, anyway, so when it left the ship after two days, I was in there were fields of uh, ripening barley just before us. They were turning gold. You know, we went from life to death in a few seconds, and I think uh, that tells you, I mean, how transient everything is. I mean, it demonstrates that you know, nature is hard, it's cruel, but that's how life is. And I think, uh, of course, I didn't think so philosophically about all this when I was watching the <laughs> sugar <laughs> being carried away by the sparrow hawk, but it was really one of those sights I think I will always remember. Bird watching is so dramatic, isn't it? Yeah. Anything can happen. Anything Thank you. Pia Sethi, tell us your favorite bird memory. So I've got just so many memories, but for me, the one which is indelibly uh, etched, uh, and, and it's a moment actually which is frozen in time. So I had gone to the lowland rainforest of Arunachal. I was scoping out and doing a recce to find out where I should work. So I was trying to understand how the hunting of large-bodied birds like hornbills will actually impact the dispersal of trees which have large seeds. Because some species are very obligately dependent on uh, these hornbills for their dispersal. So I was wandering around, walking through the forest. And of course, my first sighting of a hornbill there was was absolutely, it took my breath away. But I'm going to tell you about the first time I actually saw this hornbill, a light on this tree, and there were all these orange capsules of the species. And the hornbill very, very delicately took out this glistening black seed, threw back his head and very delicately quaffed the seed. So th that for me, in a sense, just represented how important birds are to their ecosystems. Uh, and in a sense, that's all about mainstreaming birds because they provide so many ecosystem services. And it, for me, the hornbills at that moment, I realized how important they are to rejuvenate the forests and nourish the forests. And it, it was almost a flight of fantasy in a sense. Uh, at that moment to see the hornbill doing that. And of course, after that, I got used to seeing them uh, actually, you know, prize out the seeds and eat it. But then uh, uh, that particular moment was the time I realized I was actually working on the right thing, you know. So it was motivational in innumerable ways for me. Yeah, it's amazing how birds teach us life lessons, right? Like they're so active, their lives are so hard but still they do so many things in one day. It's always, they're always doing something interesting. I take many life lessons. Thank you so much. Thank you to my panel. Uh, what a great panel and what a great discussion. Let's break now for high tea, it's outside. And we're launching the report at 6 p.m. You'll have the chance to ask many more questions to the SOIB team, which is all here uh, at the end of the program. Please join us for tea outside. Thank you.